American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcast. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Henriette de Lille, who founded the second oldest religious order for black women in the United States. But she had to reject the well established norms of her day and overcome the legacy of slavery in her hometown of New Orleans to do it. You see, Henriette de Lille was born a free woman of color in New Orleans in 1813 into a society that lived with a system called plissage. Plissage is an important part of this story, so let's spend some time talking about that. Plissage was about a wealthy white man having a free woman of color as a concubine and a common law wife. See, some female slaves would gain their freedom through one means or another. One way was buying their freedom if they or another person could amass enough money, then their freedom could be purchased. Another way could be the death of their owner. When a female slave became free, her official designation was free woman of color. This designation was also used for any women of African descent who were born free, as was Henriette de Lille. But there weren't many things free women of color could do in that society, and one of the main things was to become a concubine for a wealthy white man, that is, to enter into the plissage system. Right, and these concubines would actually live quite comfortable lives. They lived at the fashionable houses that the men kept in the city. If the men were actually married, they would keep their legitimate family out at the massive plantation outside of town. But these concubines were schooled in the arts and etiquette, and they spent their time in the city going to balls and events and visiting. Henriette's connection to this system was through her great-great-grandmother, Nanette. Nanette had been brought from Africa as a slave. When her owner died, Nanette became a free woman of color. She actually became a businesswoman herself and eventually raised enough money to purchase the freedom of her daughter and her grandchildren. And Nanette's great-granddaughter, Marie Diaz, and Marie's common-law husband, a plantation owner named Jean-Baptiste de lille Sarpy, were Henriette's parents. Yes, and Henriette received from her mother all the schooling in the arts, music, and etiquette that was proper for an octroon, or a person who was one-eighth African, and she was expected to follow her mother into the plissage system. But Henriette had an experience which changed her when she was 11 years old, when her mother enrolled her in a school that was led by Sister Sainte Marthe Fontier, a sister of the French order Dame Hospitalier. Yes, Sister Sainte Marthe had opened the school to educate young, free black girls. Henriette was 11 when her mother sent her there, and she was only at that school for three years until it closed, but those three years were formative. She was educated in the faith, importantly, the true meaning and nature of marriage, and the school encouraged the girls to teach the faith to the children of slaves, something which Henriette took part in. At the time, the law actually took a dim view of, quote, disturbing the slaves, by which the law meant educating them. So while I couldn't track down the exact story of the school, I know that it closed in 1827, and it wouldn't surprise me if that was because Sister San Marta and the girls had disturbed too many slaves. So no, Henriette was 14 years old, with a new understanding of the Catholic faith, a new understanding of marriage, and experience educating slave children. She couldn't go back to the way things had been. Uh, by all accounts, after this experience, she became a problem for her family. It seems that she had begun down the plissage path in her late teens. Some records indicate that during her teen years, she actually had two sons out of wedlock, neither of whom lived to adulthood. But regardless of that, she came to reject plissage, seeing it as the sinful offense against marriage and chastity that it is. She had really imbibed the teaching on marriage and could not be shaken from the knowledge that concubinage was contrary to God's plan for marriage. Henriette became implacable opposed to the plissage system and let everyone know it. So just as she was entering into the time in her life when she should have been finding a man who would take her as his concubine and enable her to live comfortably, she instead became an embarrassment to her family. Indeed. Her mother actually urged her to move to France and enter a convent. She refused, desiring instead to stay in New Orleans and serve the people there. Then, in 1835, her mother had a nervous breakdown and was declared incompetent by the state. Henriette was given care of her and control of her assets. Henriette provided care of her mother and sold unnecessary assets, using the money from the sale to establish a small, 
unrecognized religious community that included both white and black women. In 1836, she drew up the rules and regulations for the community and named it the Sisters of the Presentation. And eventually this community would become the Sisters of the Holy Family. But there were more hurdles to clear before that. For Henriette, her one-eighth African ancestry was a problem. New Orleans had laws against mixed-race organizations like religious communities, and the church wasn't interested at that point in rocking the boat. So even though Henriette was seven-eighths European and was light-skinned enough to identify as white, which in fact is what her siblings and other blood relatives did, she insisted on listing herself on the census as a free woman of color, and this made her ineligible to enter the all-white religious communities and complicated other matters. So when Henriette and her friends applied to be recognized as a mixed-race religious community, they were denied by both the civil authorities and church leaders. But Henriette de Lille didn't give up. No, she did not. One year later, in 1837, a new priest was made vicar general of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, Father Etienne Roussillon. He had just arrived from France, and de Lille and her friends worked with him to establish their community. He agreed to help them, but he insisted that it be exclusively for black women, not mixed race. That same year, Father Roussillon secured approval from the Vatican for the new community, but the local situation wasn't as simple. New Orleans had been shutting down black religious communities, so Father Roussillon and Henriette de Lille had to work and wait patiently and carefully to navigate the waters. What de Lille and her community had going for them were de Lille's exceptionally light skin, her well-heeled background, and the fact that their sponsor was a white man. So finally, five years later, in 1842, the city approved with the caveat that the sisters were not permitted to wear their habits out in public. That was a stipulation that Delio could accept, and the community was established as the Sisters of the Holy Family. Thus, Henriette Delille became Mother Delille and set her order working in the community to help those in need, to educate children, free and slave, to care for the elderly and sick, and to assist the poor. One of their earliest works was to take destitute elderly women into their home, and in so doing, they established the first Catholic home for the elderly in the United States. Shortly thereafter, they raised money from wealthy friends and built a freestanding home for the elderly. But I understand that not everyone was impressed with her work. No. Her brother, who, like Henriette, was also an octroon and had very light skin, listed himself and his family as white on the census. So it was a source of great embarrassment to him that his sister listed herself as a free woman woman of color. He was terribly concerned that his sister's identification would out him as being not purely white, which would harm his reputation and standing in society. So he actually moved his family to another part of Louisiana where Henriette wouldn't be known. Yes, and while it grieved Henriette, it didn't stop her. The sisters continued to do great work, including caring for the sick during various disease outbreaks like the yellow fever epidemic of 1853. And in the wake of that epidemic, the sisters began caring for many children whose parents had died and so were suddenly orphans. You know, all this talk about working with orphans, the poor, and the sick in pre-Civil War New Orleans makes me wonder if Henriette de Lille ever came into contact with another of our favorite Catholic women, Margaret Hari, the bread woman of New Orleans, whom we talked about in episode one of this American Catholic History Podcast. I know. They were both born the same year, both worked in similar ways with similar groups at the same time. They may have never met, but I'd be surprised if they didn't hear about each other. And who knows? Maybe they know each other really well these days. That may well be, because Henriette de Lille's cause for canonization was opened in 1988, and she was declared venerable in 2010. There are, at present, two miracles under investigation which would help her attain the status of blessed and saint. And as for Margaret Hari, her cause hasn't been opened yet, but, praise God, there have been investigations into it, so that may be coming also. Well, from what we've seen, they both seem really deserving. Yes, indeed. But Mother Delille didn't live up to the ripe old age of 69 like Margaret. She succumbed to tuberculosis in 1862 at just 49 years old. At the time, the Sisters of the Holy Family had only 12 sisters, but the order had such a foundation established by Mother Delille that shortly after the turn of the century, they counted 150 sisters, and in 1950, they peaked at 400. Nowadays, the Sisters of the Holy Family number 300 sisters. They run schools, nursing homes, and retirement homes in six U.S. states and in Belize. Mother Delille set down what should be on her tombstone in 1836 when she was just 23 and was founding her order. On the inside leaf of a prayer book, she wrote, I believe in God. I hope in God. I love God. 
I want to live and die for God. By all accounts, it seems in the end she did just that. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please be sure to rate us and give us a review. To learn more about today's topic, to find previous episodes, and to send feedback, please visit sqpn.com slash history. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or follow StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest.